everyone. Hi, I'm Reese Lansangan, and I'm going to be for performing an original song for you first to start off my talk. <laughs> this song is called A Song About Space, and I hope you like it. But I wonder what lies under the sun Such a tiny white dwarf when you've begun Do you think when your time is done Would you be so kind to spare mankind from the explosion? Oh, there's a part of me That longs to belong to your great black sea Float among the stars and flights to Mars and by Oh, how I wish to be Swimming inside my own galaxy So space swallow me whole Well, I'll be waiting for a black hole have a way to make a man feel displaced We were never meant to float there in the first place We were never meant to float there in the first place But we have astronauts to thank K. Mr. Moon soon I see the other side of your face Don't you think it's a bit of a disgrace to hide To keep your better half of the secret There's a part of me That longs to belong to your great black sea Float among the stars and fly to Mars and by Oh, I appear to be Just an atom with an infinity So space swallow me whole Well, I'll be waiting for the black hole Time warp, fourth dimension showed me the way to go back to yesterday and start a whole life over. Oh, comma tales, constellation show me the way to Saturn's chocolate slide where the aliens will lay. Oh, time warp, fourth dimension showed me the way to go back to yesterday and start a whole life over. Oh, comma tales, constellation show me the way to Saturn's chocolate slide where the aliens. Oh, there's a part of me that longs to belong to your great black sea Float among the stars and fly to Mars and back To where a soul could find a heavenly body that will be so kind to take me home until then, I'll be waiting for the black hole. Mercury, the closest to the sun. Venus, I could see you from Earth. You're the only one. Mars, can you accommodate living things? Hey Jupiter, I know of your invisible rings Saturn, I heard that you can float on water Hey Uranus, could be the name of somebody's daughter Neptune, you're so far away, the color of the sea Hey Pluto, you will always be a planet to me Thank you So funny story about that song that I just performed, it's called A Song About Space. And one day, this random girl tweets me and I just realized I needed the clicker. <laughs> Can somebody get me that? Thank you. 
One day, this random girl tweets me and says, Reese, thank you so much for your song. It has helped me answer the bonus questions of my science exam. Apparently, the teacher asked them for a trivia for each of the planets of the solar system, and my song served as her cheat sheet. And you know that end part wherein I sing Mercury, the closest to the sun? I ended up spoon feeding her with answers. So when I wrote space, ooh, okay, no, no. <laughs> okay, so when I wrote space, um, it was highly self serving. Um, it was my personal open letter to the universe. And I was enthralled by the idea of space and the philosophical implications of my existence. And I wanted to take this huge idea and turn that into a very simple song. But never have I thought that my song would ever be educational, let alone help someone get points for a bonus exam. So when I read that tweet, I was like, yeah, I'm a pioneer in education. You're all welcome. And it was the biggest compliment for me. My name is Cerise Lansangan, and I am a visual artist, a graphic designer, a fashion designer, and a singer-songwriter. But today, I'm primarily here as a songwriter. And so I'm going to be honest. My first attempts at songwriting, they still make me cringe to this day. I have somewhere, like, recordings of rainfall and one-sided, and the pretentiously titled Try Number 427. They are not my best works. But um, I also distinctly remember the time when I discovered YouTube. It was summer of 2006, and I know that this might be very hard for you guys to imagine, for some of you at least, but at that time, YouTube was still fairly new. And um, on the f I was on the homepage, and on the featured video sidebar of YouTube, I saw this. Anna Freeze Chained. Um, it's a girl in her living room in Portugal doing her original song with a guitar. And I thought, wait a second, I'm a girl, I have a guitar, I have a living room, I can write songs. And that was my big conclusion. I thought that it was just that simple. But after that video, my whole approach to songwriting and music has changed. Oh, no. No. Sorry, can you go back? Um, songwriting was no longer just for the Joni Mitchells or the John Lennons of the world. As it turns out, any person with an internet connection could not only write songs, but also be heard by the world. And the songs could literally be about anything, and nobody can have a say in whether or not they should exist. That was a revelation to me. Totally inspired, I decided to tell my own stories with my music. I have an indie bop duo called Reese and Vika, and this is me and Vika. We have a gig later. <laughs> um, and we have songs like... Open Your Eyes, which is about fairies and pots of gold, and Copycats, which is about, you guessed it, copycats. And we saw songwriting as storytelling, but through music. And we took it as a responsibility to write about what fascinated us. We didn't have any lofty plans for success, and we just really wanted to make music. Okay, so when we got nominated for NU107's Rock Awards, we were stumped. If you guys aren't familiar, NU107 was the go-to rock station of every cool and musical person. And now it's like, it's not existent anymore, but that time we felt cool and musical. And... No. <laughs> we ended up winning. Um, college Band of the Year 2010, and we weren't even a rock band, so we were indie. Um, but that, that moment told me something. That there was value in songs that talk about things that aren't usually talked about. We had songs about Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland and about motherhood and a bunch of other unusual topics, but somehow people still wanted to listen. But what are people listening to these days anyway? Let's look at Spotify's top 40. This is like a random selection from the middle. Look at um, the trend here. <laughs> Elastic Heart, Heartbeat Song, Half Broke Heart, Time of Our Lives King. As you can see, three out of five songs here has the word heart. And it's possibly about love or heartbreak, maybe. So what's going on? People seem to eat this romance thing up like hotcakes. Love and heartbreak is great to talk about because everybody understands it. 
But don't they say that art mimics the real world? Is the world ever really just about love and heartbreak? Is that the Cliff Notes version that we are going to get? Why is it that hardly anybody writes about the other stuff in songs? That doesn't seem to be a problem in other creative fields. Let's go to art. We have Jeff Koons, possibly the most famous living artist in the world. With his art, he talks about balloon animals, aka dogs. Um, and he fetches millions and millions of euros. Number two, um, Joyce Kilmer. Have you ever heard of this poem? I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. I'm sure you have. Somewhere in your childhood you have. And Joyce Kilmer writes, about a poem, writes a poem about trees and nothing but trees. And it's everywhere. Everybody seems to know it. It's laminated on picnic tables in Baguio. It's hammered on a row of trees in Antipolo. Everyone seems to know it. Exhibit C, Titanic. We all probably know this movie. This movie was about love, yes, but it's also about a man's ambition up against the wrath of nature. And let's look at it in music terms. Can you imagine a radio hit that's about balloon animals or trees or unsinkable ships or man's hubris? Why? It doesn't seem to work that way in music, and I, I don't know what. I'm not sure why. But why not? Songs are so powerful. They are, there are songs that are embedded in our consciousness. Think about how preschool teachers condense every important life lesson into a round song. We don't realize it, but songs are so intrinsic to our existence. Let's look at the ways that a song could affect us. Number one, a song could tell a story. As a solo artist, I wrote Trophy Boy. It was, I was seated at the back of my history class looking at this guy who sat five rows in front of me. And in the lyric of that song, I wrote about his manly shoulders. Because from my limited viewpoint at the very back of the classroom, that was all that I could literally see. And my bridge, I, in my bridge, I go, I just want to be friends with you, go down the stairs with you. I'm perfectly content with small talk. Because our classroom then was on the third floor. And that would have given us ample enough time for a conversation if it actually ever happened. But it never did. So that was me telling my story. That was me telling it as it was. But a more familiar song that effectively crafts a story is Anak by Freddie Aguilar. If you guys know that, Nang Isila, Ka Samundong, ito, that song. It's so popular, one time I was in Bangkok shopping and it started playing from nowhere. Even Europeans sing this on karaoke without knowing a single word or what it means. But the song, it paints us a picture of a Filipino family and how two parents struggle to watch their kid grow up to be a resentful brat. And we clearly see that narrative throughout that song starting from when the kid was a baby, being nurtured, then comes the pain of rejection he inflicts upon the parents, upon the, t the reconciliation. And that's a song about love, but it's familial, and it's so close to home, and it's a great story. Number two, a song to get people to talk. I have another original song. It's called Creeper, and it's about stalking, like literal stalking. You know, when you're online, you always want to know, oh, what was he wearing last night? Or how many ex-girlfriends has he had? Or something like that. Like all these other stuff. Or what's his family like? Where did he vacation last year? It's, the song is a caricature of humans and how we gather online evidence because of our desire to know. Some people find this song vaguely scary when they hear it because there's a part in the song wherein I make out myself to be an obsessive stalker but they obviously didn't get the satire. But nevertheless, it got people to re-examine how much of the song is real for them and how much is just an exaggeration. So let's go to a pop culture example. Remember this. Friday by Rebecca Black. <laughs> Rebecca Black became a household name because of her song Friday. You can think however you like. But it opened up discussions about the legitimacy of musicians and whether popular art still equates to good art. Suddenly, the music industry and its audience were under scrutiny. And it's all because of this girl. The song, be the song went beyond itself, and it got people talking. Number three, a song can be used to inform and educate. 
Remember my little anecdote about a song about space? I think that's education right there. Without even intending it, I was able to make science memorable by putting melody to it. And for me, that is crazy powerful. To put it on basic terms, let's look at the alphabet song. A, B, C, D, we all know that by heart. But try to get anyone to say the alphabet backwards, and I bet nobody would get very far. That's because we didn't learn any song from our childhood to help us translate that information to something that would be memorable for us. And that's the power of a song. Number four, a song can be used for catharsis and connection. One of my earliest releases as, an, as a solo artist was the song called NBSB, and it stands for No Boyfriend Since Birth. And as for the all songs, I wrote it as an autobiography of myself. And for some reason, girls of all ages started sending me tweets of empathy, telling me that they could relate and that they'll keep searching for the one. And the main takeaway for that song seems to be, if you haven't gotten a boyfriend yet, then it's not the end of the world, which is true. So what started out as my personal song became a song about so many other girls that I didn't even know were out there. Nope. <laughs> Isn't it magical, though, to find that your own personal story can be connected to somebody else's? That in releasing your song, you are sharing your love or your pain and making that available for public consumption. It's no longer just your love or your pain. It's now a collective experience once you write a song about it and once you let people hear it. Now, I'm neither claiming to be the future of music or saying that I'm doing something groundbreaking here, but it's pretty amazing to write songs that are so specific to me, yet somehow become relatable once I release it out to the world. I have made it my artistic state statement to be unbounded in my songwriting to inject ideas that aren't usually found in pop music. Not to be hipster, but to let people know that it's okay to just write. Not all good songs have to be about love. I have a couple more weird songs up in my sleeve, and the most recent one is called Grammar Nazi. Allow me to play like a bit of the song for you. Anyway, this is a silly song, and it has an instructional tone to it. And I went on Twitter, asked people for the most common grammatical errors that they can think of, and I crammed all the information in here. But this is, pre this is unreleased, and I'm going to be singing like a second verse to the chorus. So. I can you, sorry. Second verse. You type loose with one O. If you're losing your mind and Two O's for describing Bowel movements of any kind You see, your and your Are two different things, baby It's your Problem. You're confused, but I'ma help you out with the words you use, yeah My mama told me it's unwise to like a boy who's just nice Who couldn't put apostrophe as it is on his possessives And I need a guy Don't look, <laughs> Don't look at me when I look at you Whenever you say stuffs, cause that's my cue Ooh, ooh I'm not a Nazi I just care about good grammar Hey paparazzi, okay I just said that cause it rhymed But don't you dare commit a grammar crime on me Hey, thank you That song actually, the, the full version of that has a rap break, so watch out for that on my YouTube account. <laughs> but yeah, um, one of my friends, I let my, one of my best friends hear it, and she said this should totally be taught in schools, and I really hope that, yeah, I try to put in a lot of lessons in there so you can pick up something. Anyway, recently, here's another anecdote. There's a high school girl that came up to me and asked me where I get my inspiration for my songwriting, and I didn't know what to say exactly, 
Because if only I were capable, I would honestly write a song about every single thing. Like, for example, this TEDx talk that I'm doing. It's TEDx and I'm talking. I hope people don't start walking. That's an impromptu song. <laughs> um, but I told her that I simply wrote about what interests me, whatever that might be. And she mentioned she loved food. And I said, you should absolutely write about food. Food is important and we eat it every day. Why shouldn't we write about that? That's the real question. We might often underestimate them, but songs are potent and powerful. Songs are vehicles for story. They're tools for learning. They can express emotions that you can't find the words for. And it's a bit of a wasted opportunity, don't you think, to say things that have already been said? Why not say something different? Add to the conversation instead of adding to the noise. Which is not to say that one shouldn't write about love or heartbreak, because people should still totally be doing that. Otherwise, we won't have any Taylor Swift, which would be really, really sad. But, you know, if one day I get to hear a hit song about a bacon or a balloon flying in the city, or some seemingly random thing that paints a tiny picture of what it's like, of what it's really, really like to live in our world, then that would be my personal victory. Let us all write songs about weird stuff. Thank you so much.